Well, I want to ask you this morning if you will open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to read a little longer text than I typically do, but I think it will be helpful uh, for us this morning to uh, look at this entire text to get the context of what is going on. Several of you have asked where Martha is today. Uh, Martha is uh, with our grandchildren. I'm going to join them later on this afternoon. Um, and uh, I want to uh, I want to just say hi. I think they're all watching online right now. So I'm going to say hi, Mimi, and hi, Liam, and hi, Judah, and hi, uh, Eli, and hi, Aiden. And uh, their mom is with them, Catherine, as well. So hi to all of y'all if y'all are watching. If not, then uh, this will just be there for posterity's sake. Last week, uh, I started a new series called Heading Back When We've Lost Our Way. It's easy to lose our way spiritually, isn't it? That's why I'm in this series. We're in First and Second Kings, and we're going to be looking at a number of different texts jumping around over the course of this series. But repeatedly, Israel would lose their way, and most often, most often, it had to do with idols. God would send his prophets to call them back, and sometimes they would respond, and sometimes they wouldn't, and depending on their response, there would be catastrophe or life. Last week, we studied one of the greatest kings in all of Israel's history, Josiah, and how he led his people to deal with idolatry and with sin, and how God honored that and blessed that. And if you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go back and, and, uh, and, and listen to that message. And what we said was that it starts with a heart, a heart that has a desire to come back to God once we've lost our way. And as soon as we have a heart that desires to find our way back, uh, back to God through, through the Holy Spirit, God will guide us and he will direct us and he will give us the power and the knowledge that is necessary to find our way back. Today I'm studying an entirely different type of text. It's the opposite. And so last week I said that the heart has to be right. Today we're going to discover that we have to determine who is on the throne of our heart to find our way back to him. Now this text that I'm going to read here in just a moment, it, it condenses the entire theme of First and Second Kings. If you wanted to, to understand the entire book in a very short order, just read this text. And again and again in these two books, which, which, were, which were really never one book, never two books to start with, but, but these two books, First and Second Kings, they were split in two because they were too big to roll up into one scroll. And, and that's the way books were written back then. They were written on scrolls. They weren't bound the way, our, the way ours are today. And, and, and so, so they, it was really one unified book, but it was split up so that it would fit onto a scroll. And back in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 15, God told Jeroboam that the Lord would uproot Israel and scatter them beyond the Euphrates. But God proved to be a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and rich in love, and he delayed his judgment. God showed his grace by delaying his judgment against Israel again and again and again. And he repeatedly sent his prophets to Israel to, to warn them that a day of reckoning was coming. But now, now that day has come. And this passage that we're reading here is like a judge passing sentence on a condemned criminal. So let's read it, 2 Kings 17, beginning in verse 1. And the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah... Hoshea, the son of Eli, began to reign in Samaria over Israel, and he reigned nine years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt." And offered no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to, Assyria, came to Samaria for three years and he besieged it. 
In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria, and he placed them in Hala and on the Haber, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the customs and the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And the customs that the king of Israel had practiced, and the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in all the towns, from watchtower to fortified city. Cities. They set up for themselves pillars and ashram on every high hill and under every green, green tree. And there they made offerings on all the high places as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, providing, or provoking the Lord to anger. And they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers and that I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen, but were stubborn as their fathers had been, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They despised his statutes and his covenants that he made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They went after false idols and became false. And they followed the nations that were around them concerning whom the Lord had commanded that they shall not do like them. And they abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves metal images of two calves. And they made an ashereth and they worshiped all the host of heaven and they served Baal. And they burned their sons and their daughters as offerings. And they used divinations and omens, and they sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, and he removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but they walked in the customs of Israel that Israel had introduced. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hands of plungers, or plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. When he had torn Israel from the house of David, they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and he made them commit great sin the people of Israel walked in all the sins that Jeroboam did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight as he had spoken by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day. Would you pray with me? Lord, it's so easy for us to read these stories of great catastrophe and to see it from a time in the past that doesn't apply to us today. And Lord, I just pray that today we would listen and hear your word and that we would apply it to our lives and we would respond. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. When we read these stories, like the one I just read, we tend to think of these stories as history. And they do tell us history. But you need to understand that these books in First and Second Kings and First and Second Samuel and Chronicles, they're, they're not primarily history. We need to remember that the purpose of the Bible is not pure history. The purpose of the Old Testament historians was not to catalog various events in the chronological order and analyze the various movements of history, but to declare God's righteous dealings with his people. Therefore, great events like the fall of the kingdom were of little significance to the writers of the Old Testament unless they revealed the purpose of God. So the main point 
The main thing about this passage that we just read are not the details of the siege, nor the names of the Assyrian kings, nor the military strategies, not even the political maneuverings, all the things that secular historians would have emphasized. The main thing for the biblical historian is his long list of reasons why God chose to judge Israel. Today we come to the last king of Israel, Hosea. He ruled Israel, the northern kingdom, And from the time of the separation of Judah to the death of Solomon, uh, Israel and Judah were separate countries. And Hosea took over the crown by killing his predecessor, Pekah in a coup that apparently was sponsored, or a coup that was apparently sponsored by Tiglath Pileser, who claimed credit for putting Hosea on the throne of Israel. And Tiglath Pileser was a, the king of Assyria from 745 to 727 BC, and he expanded the Assyrian control over almost all of the Middle East, and he subjected Palestine. And evidently, one of the ways that he did so was he, exper- he, he, he uh, encouraged coup, a coup in Israel and then he put a vassal on the throne in Israel so that he didn't have to send his army and Hosea would be beholden to Assyria and he would have to pay tribute yearly. Ironically, while Hosea was not the greatest of the northern kings, he was a significant improvement over many who had come before. In verse two, it says that he, that, he, that he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as much as those who had come before him. We don't know what he did that was better than those that had come in the past, but in spite of those qualities, he was the one who was reigning when the full judgment of God burst on the country. Tiglath Pileser died, and his son Shalmaneser came to the throne. And it was during this time that Hosea decided that he might be able to get out from under the, the thumb of Assyria. So he reached out to the Egyptian king for protection, and Shalmaneser hears about this, and he attacks Israel. And after a three years' siege, Shalmaneser dies. But his brother, Sargon II, took the throne, and he defeated Israel in 722 B.C. Now remember, I said that the writer of this book is helping us to understand how God was dealing with his people and with us. Israel had clearly lost their way, so much so that they were invaded and defeated, many of them killed or taken captive, and the country never existed again. What had they done so wrong that they deserved this kind of destruction? Well, they started by worshiping idols. And that idol worship led to even more evil. One pastor said this, most modern people don't quite get the Bible's obsession with idolatry. We think of idolatry as an ancient problem for backward people who bow down to statues, not not relevant ones for sophisticated folks like us. But we aren't beyond idolatry. We simply dress it up in different clothes. Martin Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, what is idolatry? Well, an idol can be defined most simply in this way. An idol is anything in our life that occupies the place that should be occupied by God alone. Tim Keller writes this. When anything in our life is an absolute requirement for your happiness and self-worth, it is essentially an idol, something you are worshiping. When such a thing is threatened, your anger is absolute. Your anger is actually the way the idol keeps you in its service, in its chains. Therefore, if you find that despite all the efforts to forgive, your anger and bitterness cannot subside, you may need to look deeper and ask, what am I defending? What is so important that I can't live without? It may be that until some inordinate desire is identified and confronted, you will not be able to master your anger. There are certain things in Scripture that tend to beat us over the head with their persistence, and idolatry is one of them. In fact, some people have said that it is the central theme of the entire Bible, that when it comes to idolatry, we are endlessly creative. So if you want to find your way back after you've lost your way, one of the first steps we must take is to determine who is on the throne of your life. 
And if we find that there's an idol or idols there, there are certain steps that we need to take to begin our journey back to God or to find him in the first place. And the first thing the writer tells us here is that we are to remember the God who redeemed us. God calls our attention right off the bat to the Exodus and the Ten Commandments. And from the very beginning, God was a redeeming God. God redeemed his people. He says that out of the land of Egypt, from the power of Pharaoh, he redeemed them. And then not only that, God gave them direction. He gave them 10 commandments. And if you remember, the number two commandment was that I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make of yourself a craven image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water or under to the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. But instead of lasting gratitude for Yahweh, Israel looked to other gods. If we desire to resist falling into idolatry, then we start by guarding our hearts against ingratitude. Drifting into idolatry and immorality begins at that point. Colossians 3 verse 6 says that we are to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness or with thankful hearts to God. And, And so often it's not that we don't sing songs to God, it's that we don't do it with gratitude. We must do so not only in corporate worship, but also in our daily worship. Paul said, give thanks in all circumstances that God's grace has delivered us from the bondage of sin and judgment through Jesus Christ, who has led to the ultimate exodus, and we thank him for our grace. Remember this about, about idols. They never give you grace, but they always enslave. When you reject the God of the Bible, you are rejecting God's grace. Therefore, consider what God has done for us and how foolish your options are if you choose not to worship. You say, if you, if you uproot the idol that you find in your life and you fail to plant the love of Christ in its place, then that idol will, will grow back. There, there is nothing that you have that doesn't come from God. Every good thing comes from God. But it is so easy for us to fall into a spirit that believes that life is unfair. We look around and we see all the people and what they have and we think, well, if I just had that, then life would be better. If I had that husband or that wife or that boyfriend or that girlfriend or that job or I got into that school or if I had that body or if I had that house, then my life would be so much better than it is right now. And pretty soon we become bitter and harsh and ungrateful for what we do have. And the reason is we have forgotten what it is that God has given us. God has given us his salvation. He has given us his grace every day good gift we have comes from the Father. Israel had an incredible history. If you remember Israel's history, God had called them out. He had made them a people. He had redeemed them from slavery. He had given them a land. He had protected them again and again. And yet they looked around at the people around them and they forgot what God had given them and their idolatry started with an ungrateful heart. How often do you have an ungrateful heart for what you have? How often do you become bitter that you don't have what somebody else might have? So if you're going to find your way back to God when you've lost your way, you begin with remembering what it is that God has given you, and you develop a grateful heart. And then, if you want to find your way back, you remember it is God who satisfies. There are inevitable results of idolatry. People live immoral lives and they worship false gods. Why? The psalmist said in Psalm 16, 4, the sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Idols only lead to sorrow. They never bring satisfaction. Every single time they lead to sorrow. 
Baal, the golden calves, Moloch, they cannot give what the human heart longs for, namely a God who redeems and satisfies. And look at what it says in verse 15. They went after false idols and they became false. But literally it says they worshiped emptiness and they became empty. And the words we translate false as hebel, which means air, are, are, are delusion, our are vanity. They became like the idols that they worshiped. They bowed down to nothingness and they became nothingness the writer is saying. A while back on the campus of a major university, I went into the bathroom and there was a, a whole wall filled with those wonderful hand dryers, those air hand dryers. They're the scourge of the earth, I think. These little machines that blow out hot air and they dry your hands. One time I was in a restroom and someone had added another instruction under those first three. One, turn on the machine. Two, put your hands under the air. Three, rub your hands together. And four, when you're finished, wipe your hands on your shirt. <laughs> anyway, in this restroom that I was in recently, someone had scratched in another instruction. It was, push this button to hear a message from our beloved president. <laughs> Nothing but hot air. The writer of Kings describes the, religious, the religion of idolatry with the same phrase. It's Hebel, he says, nothing but hot air. And the tragedy was that the followers of that empty religion had become empty themselves. Their lives lacked substance. Their personalities became trivial. Their character lacked depth. As one man said about his friend, deep down, he's shallow. Folks, so many people live lives that are trivial. They go through the motions of their daily routine without anything to excite them, to challenge them, to ennoble their existence. And the reason is they have put first in their lives those things that have no eternal value. And when we do so, our lives become as empty as our God's. And someday they will conclude, as the writer of Ecclesiastes did, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Every now and again, you'll see a spectacular news story where someone has seen an appearance of Jesus. You've probably seen those. They've seen a picture of Jesus on a taco or a cloud or something, and if you look really, really hard, you might be able to see an image that is representative of what we think Jesus Christ might look like. I, put a few, I've got a few of these up here. This one is um, Jesus on a power pole. <laughs> Google these. I came up with hundreds of these, but show the next one if you would. This one is Jesus on a, uh, um, I think that's a piece of bread, like a, I don't know. What's kink, what? Yeah, whatever it is. This one is Jesus on a pancake. And if you look really hard, maybe you can make it out. And people go crazy over that kind of stuff. They make a big deal about it. Now, why would we do that? Just another example of that ancient human lust for something new, spectacular, particularly in religion. That's what drove so many people in Jesus' day to ask for a sign, a miracle, a sensational evidence of the validity of the faith. And that same urge is what draws so many to the elements of pagan religions around the world. But folks, we don't need a reflection, an image, to be convinced that Jesus Christ is real. When I made a commitment as a young eight-year-old boy to follow Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, he saved me. And his presence has been vividly real ever since. And folks, churches can easily fall into this trap as well. The expectation that every service has to be spectacular, that every sermon has to be the best one you've ever heard, that every program must be new and exciting. And if the pastor has an off Sunday or you aren't thrilled, 
Then we start to talk about how we didn't get fed this week or how the music was humdrum or how the student program isn't as cool as the one down the street. And we start to chase after the next experience that will excite us. We need to understand that that's a consumer mentality, expecting God to, and the church to meet our every desire when God alone should be enough to satisfy. It is the basis of idolatry. Soon you will get a new pastor. And if he is the faithful teacher of the word of God, if he shepherds you well, if he leads you wisely, then he is fulfilling the calling of God. Not every sermon is going to reach out and grab you. It's not. But week after week, if he opens the word of God and he faithfully explains it and applies it, then that is enough. Don't hold him to expectations that he can't meet or God never expected him to meet. The answer is to let God be the one who satisfies. Not some worship experience, not some program, but God. He always satisfies. False idols never do. Tim Keller in The Reason for God writes, quote, if you center your life and your identity on an idol, you find that there's nothing there. For example, if you center your life and your identity on a spouse, you will be emotionally dependent and jealous and controlling. The other person's problems will be overwhelming to you. If you center your life and your identity on your family and children, you will try to live your life through your children until they resent you or have no self-worth of their own. At worst, you may abuse them when they displease you. If you center your life and your identity on your work and career, you will be a driven workaholic and a boring, shallow person. At worst, you will lose family and friends, and if your career goes poorly, develop deep depression. If you center your life and your identity on money and possessions, you will be eaten up by worry or jealousy about money. You will, you will be willing to do unethical things to maintain your lifestyle, which will eventually blow up your life. If you center your life and your identity on pleasure and gratification and comfort, you will find yourself getting addicted to something. You will become chained to the escape strategies by which you avoid the hardness of life. If you center your life and your identity on relationships and approval, you will be constantly, over, uh, uh, constantly overly hurt by criticism and thus always losing friends. You will fear confronting others and therefore will be a useless friend. If you center your life and your identity on a noble cause, you will divide the world into good and to bad and demonize your opponents. Ironically, you will be controlled by your enemies. Without them, you will have no purpose. And if you center your life and your identity on religion and morality, you will, if you're living up to your, moral, your own moral standards, be proud and self-righteous and cruel. And if you don't live up to your moral standards, your guilt will be utterly devastating. The Bible says in Psalm 1611, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Deeper joy and more lasting joy are found in the presence of God. If you're trying to find your way back when you've lost your way, we start by remembering it is the God who redeems you. And then you remember that only God can satisfy. And then number three, we remember God's warnings. Israel knew better. After the Exodus, God gave Israel his law and he told them how to live. And he sent the prophets. In verse 14, it says, and they would not listen, but they were stubborn as their fathers had been who did not believe in the Lord, their God. They had a heart problem. They were like stubborn animals. And their stubbornness, like ours, stemmed from unbelief. It was the history of Israel. They exasperated God with their unbelief. The psalmist recaps that history in Psalm 78, 32, and it says, despite all of this, they kept sinning and they did not believe his wonderful works. 
Israel's fall into exile reminds us of the problem of hardening our heart to the word of God. And as a result of despising God's word and resisting his warnings, they went after false idols and they became false. Verse 15. We've already talked about that verse. But there's another truth about idolatry. And that is we become whatever we worship. The psalmist says those who make them idols become like them, so do all who trust in them. Psalm 115. In contrast, those who behold the glory of God are, as we read earlier this morning, as Ron did, being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. If you don't heed the warnings of God, you will become like your idols, false and worthless, or air. You see, worship really does change you. Transformation happens from the inside out. And I want to ask, are there idols that need to be removed from your temple? I got another picture up here. Can you put that one up here? That is a wharf rat. Years ago, Martha and I lived on a canal in Port St. Joe. And she kept telling me that there were squirrels in the attic. And I said, I'm not hearing squirrels in the attic. And she said, there's squirrels in the attic. I went up in the attic. I didn't see any squirrels in the attic. One night I need to get up. And so I went to get me some water about three o'clock in the morning. I walked into the kitchen and there was a wharf rat waddling through the kitchen. Massive, ugly sucker. He waddled. I don't know how he got under it. He waddled under the dishwasher and he disappeared. So the next morning, I immediately went on the hunt. And what I found was we were living on a pier and beam house. They, these, there was a colony of wharf rats that lived in the water, and they had gone underneath the house, and they had, with their big, ugly teeth, had chewed a hole through the subfloor and had gotten into the house and into the attic. Now, needless to say, we did something about that immediately. But I remember being petrified of seeing this rat. It's it's not like a little rat. It was big old wharf rat in my house at three o'clock in the morning. You do not want to welcome rats in your house. And you would not welcome rats idols either. However, some of you are more terrified of seeing that in your house than you are of having an idol in your house. Remove them ruthlessly, relentlessly. You become what you worship. If you worship praise or love of money or love of sexual pleasure or success, it will change you spiritually. Don't reject the warnings of Scripture. So if we want to find our way back when we've lost our way, we begin by remembering the God who redeems us, that only God can satisfy us. We remember the warnings of God. And finally, we remember that God is a God who judges Israel's rejection of his grace and his word provoked God to anger. He removed them from his presence. Verse 23 is one of the saddest verses in all of scripture. It said, so Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day. The 10 tribes of the north disappear, never to be heard from again. These 10 lost tribes of Israel have been a mystery through the years. People have tried to find them. They've tried to find them in Southern Arabia and the various tribes of India and China and Turkey and Kashmir and Afghanistan and the American Indians, but there is not a trace of them. The Lord removed them from his sight, Scripture says. Only Judah remained. 
And in verse 19, the writer inserts a reminder that in 160 years, Judah would follow in the same tragic pattern. Why did God judge Israel? They had followed the ways of Jeroboam, whom they made king when the kingdom split and they persisted in sin. God gave Israel warning after warning after warning, but they rejected him, and now they were banished into foreign lands, and they disappeared. They lost their inheritance. They were gone. And listen, their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren never knew of the goodness and the graciousness of God. It is so easy for us some 2,700 years after this event to think how dumb could you be to worship a rock or a stone. But friends, idolatry is not confined to shrines or pagan temples. It resides in the heart of people who look to other things to give them only what God can give. All sin problems are basically worship problems. The wrong God equals the wrong lifestyle, and some of you have lost your way. And do not believe that you are the exception to God's judgment. When God offers grace, embrace it. Would you show the last slide, please? How do we change our heart? We desire to find our way back. We read and listen to the word of God. I'm sorry, this was from last week. Somehow that got in there. But that is a good reminder from last week. So how do we find our way back? The question is, what is on the throne of your heart? What is your idol? What are you worshiping? That is not God. It always, always leads to pain. Always. But if we worship God, He is gracious and good. And he draws us back with open arms. Just like the prodigal son. He's standing there with arms wide open and he says, welcome home, my son. Welcome home, my daughter. There is a place for you here. And he begins the process of restoration and meaning and purpose for us. So have you lost your way? What is it that you're worshiping? What is on the throne of your heart? Would you bow your head and close your eyes for a moment? And I'm gonna ask you to ask yourself that question. What is it that's on the throne of your heart? What is it that you tend to worship that's not God? And will you make a commitment to do whatever it takes to to just absolutely get that out of your life? Lord, thank you for your graciousness and your goodness. Thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, came and gave us new life. And help us, Lord, to listen and learn from these people of old and not think that we're beyond it. And Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ.